It's a great pleasure to have this last event here. We were uh, thinking very much, the organizers uh, uh, were thinking very much about what to offer as a last event. And rather than to have a topical discussion, let's say the thousands discussion on the, the Euro crisis or so, we decided to do something else, which is probably a little bit of more practical value to students, um, or in my case, maybe even myself. Who uh, knows? Namely, how to build a career in political science and whether this is an academic one uh, and uh, what this might entail. It's, it's not going to be a very formal discussion. It's really meant to be a more informal one um, uh, about practical experience uh, from uh, 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 academics with, a, with a, uh, already a, a, an established track record and also uh, from people working in the field of uh, uh, career advice and uh, placement. So I will uh, immediately hand over to the two chairs, uh, Lisa and uh, Manuel, and they will take care uh, uh, of the rest and they will walk you through. As I said, after this event there will be a, a reception and uh, at the reception we would also like to announce the winners of the poster and paper prize. So uh, we are looking forward to that as well. Hi and welcome everybody. Um, today we have a round table on the very intriguing subject whether, thanks, whether and how to plan a career in academia. And Manuel will introduce our panelists and welcome to the panelists. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting division of labor. Hello everyone and welcome for coming. My name is Manuel. I'm one of, I helped, I was one of the organizers for the conference so if there's anything to blame I guess the, you, you know my email address. I'd like to briefly introduce the members of the members of the panel. Uh, and as you'll probably see during the discussion, we tried tried to get a pretty diverse um, a pretty diverse panel together in terms of career trajectories. Probably because it's still uncertain at this stage in the labor market on whether we have to prepare for one career, a single one, or whether we have to prepare for flexibility. As you as you'll see, some of our some of our panel members have been quite flexible in how they've managed to move between academia, the private sector, and back to academia, and hopefully we'll be able to harness some of that experience. Um, starting from from the leftmost corner, we have Gabriela Ilonsky from Corvinus University. Um, she received her habilitatus, I think, in 2000, and has been teaching in in 2000, I hope, and has been teaching, uh, teaching in a wide array of universities, both in Hungary and abroad. She was a visiting professor at the State University of New York in Albany, as well as in Notre Dame. In, one of, in the State University of New York, she was, a, she was a Fulbright scholar. She's been teaching in Budapest for, uh, at Covinus for a while now, so, so a consistent, consistent trajectory in academia. Following then, it's Nick Sitter, our, our own professor of Department of Political, um, Public Policy. Sorry. Uh, Nick's most recent book is called Understanding Public Management. Uh, he's gotten his PhD from LSE and, and has been also a political consultant in London before switching, uh, switching full-time to academia. Uh, further on, Kristen Backey, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, I'm sorry. Um, Kristen Backey from, um, if I get my notes here, from Univer uh, University College London. She's a lecturer in politics and IR there. Uh, widely published in Perspectives uh, on Politics, Journal of Conflict Resolution, as well as Journal of Peace Research. She's gotten her PhD at the University of Washington in Seattle, as well as her MA there. Following further, Darren Schreiber, uh, postdoctoral fellow here at, uh, here at Polberg at CEU, but also, um, also a, a former uh, assistant professor at the University of California at San Diego. PhD from, uh, from UCLA, but before that, a lawyer for the company of Neumiller and Birdsley. Hopefully I, I might have gotten that one right. And future, and future um, associate professor uh, at the University of Exeter in, in the UK. Fin last but not least, uh, Christina Balinagi from, from the CEU's Alumni and Career Office, who joined CEU in 2007, but before that had seven years of experience in, in business. So. She is probably the one most, uh, most uh, familiar with the situation of employment of CEU PhD, um, PhD graduates. Um, without further ado, can I, uh, can I launch into the first question? And here I, we, had to, we had to struggle for a bit. We, th we thought of starting lightly, but let's, start, uh, let's get the bad news out of the way first, if there is any bad news. I'd like to ask whichever, whichever members of the panel feels, feels that, that uh, this, uh, they're providing, they're providing uh, an interesting perspective. How do you feel that the job market is 
these days for political science graduates compared to maybe five or ten years? Should we prepare for a career in academia or should we kind of go towards the more flexible job market skill that will maybe allow us to go into the private sector as well? Well, a light one to begin with. <laughs> Well, I'll, 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 I'll have a stab at it for two reasons. One, I'm actually, uh, I'm, yeah, one on a sort of CEO angle. And the second is, I actually put down four points. And I'll just get them out now. And okay. they kind of answer the first question, kind of answer everything. Look, uh, we were just chatting about this earlier and came to the conclusion, don't bother. Uh, but then we started talking about other careers. And we thought, well, that's even worse than other careers. So you might well, actually want to bother. But the long and the short of it is, is I think, uh, the, the message is plan B. I think I've seen a lot of really good academics go out with really good PhDs and end up in really good universities, but in the meantime, they've gone through two or three years of unemployment or working in the middle of nowhere or working way outside their field. So I think my point is, if you, if you really want to go for it, you've got to persevere for a long, long time, and there's a lot of 10-hour days in there. So it's a lot of hard work, and, uh, and you've got to persevere massively, and I think the only way you can do that is to have a plan B and think, what am I going to do for a couple of years before I get the academic job that I want? So that was the slightly better version of the don't bother. Um, second point, very, very quickly, uh, I, I, I sort of looked through seven or eight questions, now I can sum, all, sum them all up, is don't say no. Uh, the one thing heads of department appreciate is people who don't say no. So don't say no when you're asked to teach. Don't say no when you're asked to do admin. Don't say no when you're asked to publish, even if what you're asked to do has absolutely nothing with your core area of competence. I wrote my PhD on party politics and nationalism. I worked as a consultant on energy policy. I wrote my first piece on telecommunications regulation and my second piece on alcohol policy. It had absolutely nothing to do with anything I could, I could deal with. Uh, third point, uh, co-author. I can't remember which answer that is in reply to. <laughs> uh, but I thought it's such a good answer that whatever, whatever the question is, the answer is probably co-author. Co-author with nice people. My, my own advice is don't bother networking for networking's sake. Don't stick to the network that's linked to your supervisor only. But find nice people you trust and write together with them. It's much more fun and it forces you to do stuff. And my fourth point, and I think the most important one, if you're really serious about going for an academic career, don't look for one only on the area where you're doing your PhD on. Your PhD is not your masterpiece. M most, at least half the top academics I know d didn't publish their PhD as a book. A PhD is an apprenticeship. It's on a topic, but you should be able to do much more than that. I would advise you to have at least three broad topics. One or two of them could be related to your PhD, but if you want to broaden your chances, you've got to go way beyond your PhD, empirically and theoretically. That's a long-winded four-point question, <laughs> and I think I've said everything I wanted to say. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Um, yeah. May I join in? We expected that we shall fight about uh, with our opinion, but unfortunately this is not the case. So uh, I agree with, uh, with most of the things that uh, you have just uh, said, maybe with some different, uh, you know, wordings. Uh, so about the job, I think uh, uh, compromise is a key word in this. So. Uh, we all have to make compromises, and particularly when you are a starter in your career, you have to make compromises. The thing is, uh, what to compromise about, what to compromise on. So, uh, I would uh, accept uh, all offers, uh, part-time jobs, or part-time positions, or postdoc positions, or really seemingly not very you know, challenging uh, things that keep you or help you to, to remain around or near the academia. Uh, of course, consultancy and these other jobs might be also challenging, so really that's also a kind of agreement that, okay, if you have uh, uh, received a good offer from a consultancy uh, firm or uh, even from, uh, from a private firm which seems to not to lead you too far from your original expectations and wishes, okay, go for that. But uh, uh, my first advice would be really is that uh, make compromises, but only compromises that do not take you too far away from your original ideas or from your original plans. Now, contrary to what the introduction has said, 
probably I'm, I'm the person who doesn't fit in this panel at all because uh, I have worked only at one place, at one university in Budapest. Of course, I, I, was, uh, uh, I have been traveling around and teaching in other places, but this is my location and uh, I've, I've never worked uh, anywhere else. I, I never had a position anywhere else. So, uh, Okay. Now, to the other point, and then I, I also run through uh, my points, really, uh, very many, even older colleagues have already stated that uh, the importance of the PhD dissertation, the dissertation as it is itself, you know, has decreased. So I, I also accept that perspective. Uh, the former generation uh, found and, and thought about his or her PhD dissertation as a fundamental piece of, of, of work, you know, the most significant achievement of his or her life. Now, this is not the case any longer. So it's app apprenticeship, as you have put it. Uh, so really, uh, we all should keep uh, our eyes open and uh, be uh, open-minded, not in terms of general values, but open-minded in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what uh, fields, uh, what new related fields to take up, or even if there is an offer which seems to be not related at all to your former research, go for that. And, and uh, uh, go for networks and uh, try to find uh, networks uh, who are around. I think, for young people uh, as well. But uh, if you are lucky enough, then you can join a network uh, where a nice combination of more established scholars and, and younger scholars are around. Uh, so these are my initial thoughts. OK. So since everyone is answering this question by uh, raising all their points, maybe I should uh, do the same. So my initial, the first thing I wrote down was that this is, the, this is pretty much the best job in the world, I think, to be an academic. Uh, I love what I do for a living. I like, love, love, love what I do for a living. And uh, how many people you know, can say that? And, um, but you, know, you might not love what you do. If you, if you don't like what you do in grad school, then academia isn't going to be for you. Uh, I think of you know, moving from grad school to uh, um, a lecturer job, in some ways you do keep doing much of the same what, as what you did as a grad student, except people pay you a little bit more, and you have a little bit more uh, authority. So, you know, but if you think this is what you want to do, don't be scared by the fact that you know, the labor market is tough. The labor market is tough for anyone right now, regardless of what you want to do. Um, now, in terms of strategies of, uh, of, of getting jobs, you all know the drill, this publication, publication, publications. Uh, and particularly if you're, I mean, I was in graduate school, I was always told that if you have your PhD from, uh, from an Ivy League, maybe you can get a job without a publication. But if you don't have your PhD from an Ivy League, you need publications to get a job. You need external validation. So you need publications, ideally good, or at least you know, one really good publication. You need to show that you can have, you get external grants external validation that way. And also, um, you need, it might be a good idea to apply for postdocs that, that give you a little more time to sort of focus on writing before you start to, uh, applying for tenure track uh, teaching jobs. The, um, another point to raise that, ha that has been raised by these others that I agree with is to be, be flexible. And it's also be flexible about geography. Right? Be flexible about moving. Don't be too wedded to, and you, know, you all are doing your PhDs in a great city. Um, you might, your first job not, not be in a, a city that is as great as Budapest. On the research agenda, I'm not sure I agree, in, agree entirely with what, what has been said uh, so far. So it's great. I mean, you need to have a wide research agenda beyond your PhD. I do think, at least from, from my perspective, sort of sitting on search committees too, is that it might be good that there, there's at least a red thread, a co somewhat coherent theme in your research agenda. So you might be working on different, I work on political violence and you know, different parts of political violence. Um, and it's, it's, I think, or a perspective that's slightly different, is that it is useful that someone who looks at you from the outside can say, like, this is her profile or his profile. This is what, where this person's expertise is, so that you're not sort of all over the place. So that differs somewhat from these, what these people are saying, but of course they have more experience than I do. Um, 
collaboration um, and collaboration, don't collaborate for the sake of collaborating. Collaborate with people you like, people you trust, and collaborate with other graduate students. Um, some of the most fun uh, projects I've been working on have been with two other people, uh, Kathleen Cunningham, uh, who's in the US, and Lee Seymour in Holland, whom I met when I was a graduate student. At they were not, We were, did not go to graduate school together. We met at conferences, and we were kind of just introduced by common friends, so you should talk to Lee and Kathleen. They work on sort of similar things, and then we said, kind of uncommittal to begin with, oh, we should all do something together. And this is, I don't know how many years ago, but six, six seven years ago. And we've been working together ever since, published a couple of articles. We sat down at the la last ISA, talked about four new paper ideas. And this is, you know, so think of other graduate students as people you want to network with, people at the same stage in your career. So it doesn't have to be the big name peoples or the big name networks you want to be part of, but you can create your own networks, your own co-authors and collaborators. Um, and that's part of what this makes this job really fun. So we're all doing our, our points. I guess I'm going to do the combination of uh, my, my three main ideas, um, but also just tell a little bit of my life story because I think it fits in with some of this. As Manu had mentioned earlier, um, I was a lawyer, um, went straight from college, didn't know what I wanted to do, and my uh, mentor at the time said, you know, what are all the possible careers you might want to do? And after I listed them all out, he said, oh, well, you can go to law school. And this is exactly the opposite advice of what I would tell anybody um, to do. And so you've all made a much wiser choice than I did uh, straight out of college and in not uh, incurring the debt and horrific uh, legal culture of the American law scene. Um, but having done that, I found myself in a really odd position once I started practicing law in that I was doing something that I was really good at. I mean, I, I realized as I went, I went to law school just because, you know, I was just going to go to law school. And once I started doing it, I had my first jury trial at 23. I had in a constitutional law issue in a federal court, like three-day jury trial. It was as unrealistic as the TV shows about lawyers are. I mean, it was a completely unreal experience. And it was an incredible experience. And I really loved it. And then I started the actual daily practice of being a lawyer, and I could feel my soul being crushed minute by minute because I'd had this opportunity in law school working at legal clinics to do excellent work that I was really enjoying, that was using my skills, and then the actual practice of law sucked, and it was miserable. And I went through this really soul-searching, gut-wrenching experience of, of finding, you know, like they, should always, they always say, you should do what you're good at. I was doing something I was really good at. And, and they were wrong. Um, you shouldn't do what you're good at, because it turns out there's this whole literature on expertise. One of the things I'm interested in is the development of political expertise. How do people become politically sophisticated? And the literature on expertise in a wide variety of fields has shown, they call it the 10,000 hour rule. That if you spend about 10,000 hours doing something, you can be world class good at it. If you add up the number of hours you're going to put into your PhD, um, you're looking at 10,000 hours. You can be really, really good at this thing that you're investing your time and energy in if you choose to. And if you, put the, if you do the right kind of study, if you do the right kind of work, you can develop yourself into being the expert. One of the things that was shocking when I was a young lawyer was when I, I finally had finished researching uh, this bankruptcy issue and I came to the associate attorney I was working for, a senior associate, and I said, okay, now have I done it right? And he goes, you're the expert. You've been researching this obscure topic of whether a uh, liquor license is a license is a property right or a you know uh, a, a license for like three weeks. You know more about this than anybody else in the country. You're the expert, and that was at 25 just a bizarre thing that I was the expert. And now you are becoming the experts. This is an apprenticeship. You're becoming the experts. Um, and you're going to be able to develop a set of skills that will enable you to be world class at what you're doing, to know more about what you're doing than um, anyone else. The question, though, the, the, the question I was posed when I was a first year graduate student by John Zoller, my advisor, was on day one, um, do you find yourself going to bed at two in the morning wishing you could stay up and do just a little bit more political science? Um, and if you don't find yourself at two in the morning wishing you could do a little bit more political science, this is probably not the right thing for you. And I think that's true. Um, this is a phenomenal career. There was a study done recently that showed that like, being a university professor was number 14 on the rank of you know, great to crappy careers, and like number 114 was lawyer. And so I had made a 100 point increase from no, 114 to 14 um, in one career move. And this is a wonderful career, 
but it's really hard. It has a tremendous number of difficulties of sacrifice of time, of a lot of life consequences. Um, and the question really needs to be, ultimately, is this the right set of sacrifices to make for you? Is this the right choice for you? And the way that I went about thinking about this in the transition, the couple of years as I was transitioning from being a lawyer to being an academic, um, was a process that I now teach my, my students called finding your mission. And I would argue for a three-step process. Uh, the first step being uh, quiet. So to let go of your preconceptions about the world, to let go of your preconceptions about yourself. If, you know, when I was a little kid, people said, oh, you'd be a natural lawyer, right? You've got this, you can, you're really argumentative, you know how to do public speaking, you have all of these sets of skills. Let go of all of those things that if, you know, grandma always told you you are a natural, just let go of that. Let go of all of the preconceptions you have from your culture, from your family, from yourself, from what everyone has ever told you. Start by just allowing yourself to let go of those preconceptions of what the, the, the world has told you like, oh, this is a prestigious job or this is something that you should be aiming for. Let go of all of those things. I think that has to be the first step um, in this inquiry about the career track and trajectory that you're going to be going on. Second is what I would describe as listen. So having let go of all these preconceptions, having let go of all these ideas about who you think you are, um, start to pay attention to your life story. What were the things that you've been most passionate about in your life? What have been consistent elements across the context that you've been in that really are you, that are the signature elements? Um, in the positive psychology literature, they call these sometimes signature strengths. But the, the patterns that you find again and again and again that you're attracted to, even though you change contexts, the skill sets that you use, even though you're in a slightly different job or working on a different project, um, the people that you've admired most, pay attention to who are those people and what is it about them that you admire. So I admire Martin Luther King, but I admire him for probably different reasons than many other Americans who, who find him to be an admirable person. Um, identify those characteristics of yourself by listening to the set of experiences that you've had in the world, by listening to what excites you, what keeps you going when you're completely drained. What um, keeps you up till 2 in the morning? What questions, what skills, what tools, doing what on a daily basis has really drawn you in? And then finally, as a third part of this finding your mission process, I would argue do. So one of the nice things about the academic track is this is an apprenticeship. And you are getting to do in bits and pieces um, as a graduate student what you're doing as a faculty member. You're working on papers, you're doing original research, you're developing new ideas, you're going to conferences and presenting them, you're submitting things for publication, um, and you get to do inherently in a PhD program the kinds of things that you will be doing if you choose an academic career. If you find in this doing process that this isn't really for you, that's good information and valuable information because there are some just real uh, constraints and limitations to the way that academia is done in the modern world that there's no way around. You, you have to publish or you perish. That is just the way that it is. And if you don't like, I don't particularly like writing. Um, I find it to be much more difficult, but it is part of the deal. Um, I love teaching. I love lecturing. I love uh, my mission statement for, because uh, I wrote a mission statement. I went through a process of finding my own mission and, and the result of this process for me was a mission statement. And so for each of the elements of my life, I have a mission statement. Um, for my teaching, it's enabling my students to learn joyfully, read carefully, think clearly, and write well. For my academic research, it's to develop, test, and publish my best ideas about uh, complexity and emergence in political systems. And the published one, I added forcibly upon myself. It wasn't originally in my mission statement because my mission was really, pre I, I said I want to present my ideas. But you know, you don't survive in academia if you just present your ideas. You really do have to publish them. And I realized that this, even if it's not exactly what I wanted initially, this is, if I want to get these other goals, I need to do this thing and I need to, to go against um, my inhibitions about writing um, to get that accomplished. If you're choosing to go down this road, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be hard. It's going to be very difficult. But if it's your mission, then it's going to be worth doing that. The nice thing about having identified a mission for yourself by, by going through a process to really carefully uh, look for what your mission in life is, is that once you've identified it, 
it makes it much easier to make the sacrifices that, you, that are incumbent in making that, that career choice. For me, I don't have the, uh, the, the fancy car that my you know, friends that I've gone to law school with. I don't, have, you know, many, I don't have a house on the beach like some of my friends I went to law school. I don't have their debt load. Um, but I, and you know, I'm living in Budapest, so there's some upsides on this account also. But there are, there are costs and benefits. If you need to have a house, Americans, part of the American dream is you have to have a house. I have never owned a house, and I'm you know, 42. Um, there have been consequences of the choices that I've made, but those consequences have been worth it because of the, 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 the this is my mission. Um, People were talking about being flexible, and I think it is much easier to be flexible in terms of saying yes to different opportunities if you know why you're saying yes. So for me, I ended up taking a postdoc um, out of UCLA at the Center for Ethnopolitical Conflict. Now, my research is using brain imaging to study, the polit study political ideas and how people, uh, using brain imaging to study how people develop their political ideas and develop um, and do their political thinking which when I describe that doesn't make you probably think, oh, ethnopolitical conflict, that's where Darren should be. Um, but there was an opportunity there that fit with my larger and a piece of my research agenda and gave me an opportunity to do the kind of work and explore my ideas. The next position I had after that was as a research director at the Center for Cancer, Ex uh, Excellence in Cancer Communication. And when I was offered this position, it was doubling my salary of the postdoc. And I looked at the person who was offering me this position. And I said, you know, I don't know anything about cancer. And he said, yes. I said, but the job is in a cancer center. And he said, yeah, but you know lots of things will be useful. And I was just totally incredulous to this. And it was the first time I've ever had a job interview where the person interviewing me was like really having to sell me on my qualifications <laughs> for this job. It was a very odd dynamic. But eventually they convinced me, and I, I saw it. And it was a really good fit for me. And it was a wonderful opportunity to work in a large team, to do co-authorship, to, to do a very different kind of academia than I'd done in the past. Um, and I was able to be me to, because I knew who I am. I knew what I'm about. I know what my mission was. I knew that taking this job at a Center for Excellence in Cancer Communication Research, even though it's very weird on my resume, fits in a really weird way into the intellectual trajectory that I've been developing over a number of years. So once you know who you are, it makes it much easier. I, I think of Job searching is like dating, probably because I've done a lot of dating um, in my life. And you know, there is this parallel between if you know who you are, it makes it much easier to date. It makes it much easier to find a person that's a good fit and to identify somebody who's not, like the, you know, the, the, the drummer for the you know, metal band may not really be a good fit for you, even though they have beautiful, long flowing hair. Right? If you don't like loud music, ultimately, and you know that about yourself, don't go there. So the more that you know about yourself, the better it is to find that right fit in academia. I was told by one of my mentors at UC San Diego that you should have one idea per paper, one idea per book, and one idea for a career. And I think that this was Matt McCubbins giving the same kind of advice that I'm trying to convey to you, which is what is your one idea? What is that thing that you are about that's driving you that can manifest itself in a lot of different ways, like an Indian god, um, like a Hindu deity, right? You can have lots of manifestations, but figuring out who you are and how you're going to manifest in each of those situations allows you to develop the integrity and, and set of skills that is authentically you, just you in different contexts, so that you can do this both, be flexible, but not so flexible that you don't develop yourself as an intellect, that you don't develop yourself as a, as a personality and signature, and as an authentic person. So, thanks. Thank you, Darren. Um, okay, so it's my turn. I, I don't have such a structure of, of points, but uh, in the career office, I, more often than not, we see people um, that already decided that career in academia is maybe not their, their thing that keeps them up until in the morning, or that keeps it, them up for all the wrong reasons. So somehow the, the, the students that we see in the career office are looking for alternatives from academia. Um, also, more often than not, we, we see a lot of uh, CVs with different kind of experience because the student at some point realized that, hey, maybe the job market will not be satisfied only with uh, my uh, credentials in academia. So I have to show that I have some additional skills and I have some practical experience. So, so people start to, to collect all these kind of, of, uh, of jobs just to, to put something on their CV. And, and at the end of the day, you cannot, from reading the CV, you cannot see if this person is a researcher, if this person is a 
volunteer um, supervisor, if this person is a management consultant or a teacher, or you don't know the brand. So you have to have, like Darren said, you have to have the idea, you have to have the, the flow. What is it that, that is describing you as a, as a candidate on the job market, big academia or not? And uh, luckily, the, there are a lot of tools how to do that. So you can still work in academia. You can still keep an eye um, on the alternative um, outside academia. For example, while working in academia, while teaching, while doing your field research, you can still talk to uh, be a practitioner and talk to, to people for the informational interviews, for example. And while you collect the information for your research, just in the background, look at them as they will be your potential employers. So be, it can be a plan B, so you can still network with them, you can still keep in touch with them, because at some day, in one day, they might be employers if you decide to step out from academia. So um, what I'm saying, I'm not um, taking part of career in academia or not. We know that there is a tough market. We know that 10 years ago, for example, we conducted a uh, survey about um, destination, career destination of, of doctoral students at CEU, 75% uh, were reported that they work in academia. Now it's only 67%, so it's, it's a bit lower. But still, 62% or 67%, it is a big number. So it is possible to have a career, even if it's a tough job market. It's still possible. Thank you for this optimistic comment. Um, <laughs> Um, it's very hard to come up with a follow-up question because you raised so many interesting points, but maybe I would like to go back to the comment on, on publishing. Um, is this job still about teaching? Should we go for teaching positions? How important is it to have teaching experience? I, I love teaching. Um, one of the things that for me, it, there was a great book, there's a book called um, How to Be a Great College Teacher. And the person in this book, in addition to giving a lot of really wonderful insights on um, techniques and skills and everything, it's a great piece of research because they report lots of literature on what we actually know about college teaching and what the studies show. And there is a positive correlation between publication success and teaching success. They are not, they are not, they are not um, an antithetical to each other. And I think that if you're doing your teaching correctly, there are positive feedbacks. I use my, the way that I structure my classes is entirely to play with ideas in front of a room full of students. And it allows me to, to do a rehearsal of the ideas that I'm developing the, and to synthesize them in such a way that it helps me to have a deeper understanding of the research that I'm conducting as I'm doing my research towards publication. So for me, I don't see them at all in opposition. I see the research part of this uh, career as being, uh, the teaching part of this career is being essential to my research agenda and being a way that I can, I can use it as a laboratory to explore in front of 100 or whatever, 30, depending on your class sizes, sometimes 300, um, very interested uh, reviewers because they're, they have to pay attention because they're going to take an exam that you're writing. And you know, they have more of an incentive to pay attention to what you're saying than anybody else really ever will in your academic career. So if you can leverage their intelligence and their insights and their critiques, it can really help you to develop your own ideas. I want to echo some of, some of these comments. I also really like teaching. And I think there is, it's important to view teaching as this learning. It's a two-way process. You're learning from your students. You get to engage with really smart people who have new perspectives. Uh, now, in terms of getting the teaching job, um, so whether you want to do teaching or you want to do research for a career, you're gonna, you have to have the publication record uh, to get your first job. So publishing is, is just part of the game, it's the entrance ticket to getting the job. And it's the entrance ticket to, teach, to keeping the job too. Uh, even at you know, what we think of as mainly teaching institutions, you still have to have the publishing record in order to get tenure and keep the job. Um, so it's, it's just part of the, it's part of the game whether you, you like it or like it or not, whether you want it or not. Um. I, will, I will join in, uh, with this uh, teaching part. So I think that's a very important uh, part of our career. And uh, it helps a lot because uh, 
uh, you will get feedback. Uh, even even uh, from the examinations, you will get feedback how successful you were to present your case and to argue for certain themes. And of course, the students will uh, bring in very many good ideas. Um, and uh, they can double check your thoughts. So, uh, so really, uh, teaching, ideally, teaching and research should go together. Now, as for the publication bit, uh, of course, we all know this pressure, publish or perish. And uh, during my career, uh, you know, I could notice that there are always fashions, that there have always been fashions in this. So when I started my career, uh, we tended to publish in books. You know, book chapters were the main, you know, element uh, that was cherished and that was found important. Now came the stage with the uh, journal articles. And now we are facing, uh, I think, a third period with, with uh, open access journals, right? So that, that's a challenge and uh, the academic community still has to respond uh, how uh, the, we shall reflect to these open access journals, how it will change uh, or transform our uh, profession, really. So there are fashions in this, uh, publication categories and, and things, but uh, uh, the overall message or my overall experience is that certainly uh, writing up things, even if uh, sometimes it's very tiresome, uh, but uh, it, it is a challenge that we also have to respond because it helps you clarify your thoughts and uh, it helps uh, uh, for, uh, you to, to take the next step in your research, for example. Uh, but how to do it is not always uh, easy. Uh, I, uh, my personal advice, uh, advice would be that if you are in the process of preparing uh, an article, for example, it might uh, help if, if you find as many uh, people to read that, uh, that first version or the second version or the third draft as you can, right, to get feedback. Uh, even, uh, although I might be wrong in that and not all the established scholars are that uh, open as we should be, but even you can send your uh, piece uh, uh, to an unknown person, so a person who you, you don't know in person, but might, that person might be the reviewer uh, for your article because he or she is the expert in the field. So take up this challenge and, uh, and uh, send your drafts and discuss, if, if it's possible, discuss these drafts with people who are interested and talk about it uh, with people who, who know the field because it will help uh, the publication to be really successful. Uh, it, is, uh, it, uh, it is often a question where to send these pieces. Shall we start, uh, you know, in a more modest journal, let's put it that way, or shall we start with the American Journal of Political Science or something. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that uh, we always have to be modest. So if you think that this particular theme, that your article, is something that might find its place in, in one of the best journals, go for that, right? So we shouldn't start at you know, a very modest or medium rank or whatever journal. So be brave in that. But to be able to be brave, uh, really you have to uh, you know, proceed uh, with the discussions and uh, with, uh, uh, with sending out your drafts and uh, with working uh, uh, on it uh, a lot. Not to mention that you can learn from feedback, even if the article yes, sure. is rejected. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So even even a, a review which is not uh, very positive, so to say, uh, will help. We have to survive it, but still. <laughs> On this particular point of, of rejection, um, if you if you take a career, just I'll make an analogy to dating. Um, rejection is just going to happen. Right? Like, this is inherently part of the academic uh, career trajectory, is that you're going to get rejected. You're going to fail again and again and again and again and again. 
and again, <laughs> and again. And it's just, it's gonna be that way. And so um, I realized at one point, having thought, I, I, I can't, I think I was reading a, a book by Stephen Jay Gould, he was just going over some baseball statistics. And it was just, so in American baseball, if you can hit the ball one out of three times, you can get a million, multi-million dollar contract for hitting the ball one out of three times. You are a rock star. And in academia, if you can hit a ball one out of five times, you are also a rock star. Um, the, it, we have incredibly high rejection rates at most of the top journals. At even many of the kind of mediocre journals still have pretty high rejection rates. And um, this means that you're going to need to fail often. If you're getting your articles accepted or if you're getting grants at a higher than appropriate failure rate, you need to increase your failure rate. I realized at one point that I had gotten most of the grants I was applying for and that this was a mistake because it meant that I was leaving a huge amount of money on the table by not applying for more grant opportunities. If you've been successful, that should tell you that you're not failing enough and that you should be pushing yourself to send things out more often, to be rejected more often. Um, I was, one of the, the, the bad pieces of mentorship I got when I was a graduate student was that I needed to, to, to solve the problem or have answered the question. Um, and when I got to UCSD, um, Matt McCubbins, my mentor there, and James Fowler, one of my very, very insanely, ridiculously productive friends, um, said their rule about how they, Zoller's sort of idea about when to publish was when it was 100% done. And that after eight years of my dissertation and a job at UC San Diego, he said, you know, you should really spend a couple more years to figure this out. You still haven't nailed the dissertation yet. And this was crippling advice. Um, that I, by that time, had, after eight years, learned to ignore. When I got to UC San Diego, I was told, when it's 80% done, send it out. Get, you don't know what the last 20% is that you need to fix is, and your judgment on that last 20% is probably gonna be wrong. So sending it to colleagues, sending it to other people to get feedback so that they can give you their read on what that last 20% is, is much more valuable than you dealing with your own neurotic uh, perfectionism and trying to figure out what that 20% is because guaranteed when you send it out it will be very high likelihood you know 80% chance it'll be rejected um, and they will tell you that the 20% that you thought you needed to work on is not the 20% they cared about so use this as an opportunity to learn what it is that that next 20% um, needs to be to submit the papers to conferences submit them to to colleagues and then once they're in that B minus range. Once you think that maybe they're not perfect, but they're good enough, give it a go and see what the neck, what the reviewers tell you is the 20% that you need to add. Thank you. Nick, do you want to? Oh yeah, I, I'll chip in with my bits. Uh, I've kind of waited a little bit to the end because I've fun, I, I think I disagree with just about everything um, <laughs> that's been said so far. Uh, but it's good because we have a sort of fairly heterogeneous panel here. I do agree with some things. I won't mention those. But look, I think um, three or four points. First point is. You can think of academia as a, as, a, as a job, or you can think of it as a calling. And I think it's pretty obvious that around this table, you've got a big spread of this. I, I fit more into the think of it as a job business. I mean, I like reading books, and I'm quite happy that I've found somebody who's actually willing to pay me a bit of money to read books. But I do realize that the reason they pay me money is that I have to do some stuff I don't like as well. Uh, I, I don't stay up till 2 o'clock and think about my work. The number of Sundays I have worked since I finished my MA uh, I could count on the fingers of one hand, okay, maybe two hands. I don't work Saturdays, I don't work Sundays. I think academia should be a nine to five job. I realize that it's probably gonna be a nine to seven job, quite a lot, but nine to seven is 10 hours a day. Most of my colleagues who work more than 10 hours a day spend an awful lot of that time uh, looking up football scores on the internet or drinking coffee. So I, I actually tend to go on the, on the job side of it and to take a, a possibly less optimistic view of it. I think if you get a job offer where you can go on and work on your PhD topic for the rest of your life and do lots and lots of good research at a top university, great. But I also think most academic jobs aren't like that. Um, possibly the five of us who say, here actually have jobs like that. Um, but my second point uh, was a repetition of what I said earlier. This was about the publications, I think, your question. T teaching. Teaching, sorry, teaching, teaching, that's it. I've written down, don't say no, and try it. <laughs> 
And I think that was by my basic approach. I basically accepted every teaching job I could get, whether it was teaching about Khrushchev uh, to, to, to BA students or counterterrorism for oil executives. It's all fun. Um, I don't quite buy the teaching research link. It's certainly not quite there in my experience. Uh, or if it's there, it's there in another way. It's there in the fact that when you're asked to teach about stuff you don't know a lot about, you have to read up on it, and you actually become a much better academic because you know about stuff which isn't your core area. I think the real danger today is that we have a lot of academics who are, to put it slightly facetiously, experts on things they know nothing about. They are very, very good at knowing something about a very, very small amount, a small topic, but they have very little knowledge around it. Taking up teaching jobs is one way of forcing you to stay abreast of what's going on in your field. So that's a very different reason for coming to the same recommendation that everybody else says. Second point about that is try it. And if you don't like it, don't keep doing it. Uh, if, you, if you get an academic job, they pay you to teach. If you don't want to teach, apply for a job in a think tank. There's plenty of good research institutes. And here's my third point. Whether you take a university job or whether you take a research institute job, you're going to have to compromise. Um, there's, there, was a, there was a show a couple of years ago called Dream On, which was about an American publisher. And the compromise he made with his boss was for every uh, mass hit paperback he produced, he was allowed to produce one worthy literature book as well. And I think it's a little bit like that. You do have to do some publications and teaching, that's for the market, but that buys you some time to do the really interesting stuff that you want to work on as well. I don't think it has to be one thing, I think it can be several. If you don't go for a teaching job, your compromise is not so much about your teaching, but it's about you have to write about the kind of stuff you can get money for. If you're lucky, you'll get lots of money for exactly what you want to do. But most people I know, particularly in Norway, where there's a very, very large think tank world, actually have to actually end up doing research on things they're not really that interested in. So there is a, there is a cost and a benefit to the whole thing, and you can't get away from the cost unless you're very, very lucky. I'd say most of us have to pay some kind of cost. Final point, um, there was something about, oh, something about writing. That's probably where I agree with, with most of the others, actually. Uh, it, it's, if it's good enough, send it out. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. What I do disagree slightly with is using journals as a testing ground for stuff that's, that's three quarters written. There's nothing more annoying than being a reviewer and seeing a piece which is clearly not finished. And most of my friends who are editors of journals are moving towards telling us all, accept or reject, don't revise and resubmit. Far too many reviewers go for the easy option, which is to say revise and resubmit. Most good editors instruct the reviewers not to go for that option, unless it really, really, really is revise and resubmit that it's going to be accepted. So for journals, send out the good stuff. But say yes to a lot of publications and book chapters and things like that, which doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. Do it on time. Meet your deadlines. Don't go over deadlines to make, make it perfect. If it's OK, send it out. Can I just, uh, I'm going to quickly sort of react just a little bit to what uh, Nick was uh, saying here. So I, I, I review a lot of articles. I'm currently on the editorial board of Journal of Peace Research. and I. I agree with this. Um, I'm, as an associate editor, I would like to get the reviews that say either accept or uh, reject rather than the uh, R and Rs. Um, I do think it send out. You know, the eight, I don't think you meant by 80% finish that it shouldn't be yeah. good. But especially as a graduate student, make sure that what you're sending out is is good. It's high quality work that you're sending out, and it's as a graduate student in terms of getting jobs. I think it's quality over quantity that matters in terms of publication. So aim really, as you said earlier, aim high, send out good work, and you know, aim for those top journals uh, with your work. And there are different strategies for thinking about how do, you know, how do you have time to write articles when you're writing your dissertations. Are you writing monologue dissertations? Not article-based, so monologue dissertations. So there are, I'm sure you know, you've heard of, or people have told you about how to think about slicing and dicing your work into articles, but sort of my two cents on this would be to either think about are there separate chapters of your dissertation that you can publish or are there you know one theme that runs around runs not around but through several of your chapters that you can sort of slice and dice from each chapter to make sort of a, 
a coherent theoretical argument with different cases, for example, from different chapters. So you know, think creatively about how you can use your dissertation to, to create articles. And then, of course, you might have these spin-off ideas, spin-off projects that are kind of related to your dissertation. You don't quite know if it's going to go in there yet, but it's relevant enough to work on. You might learn some new methods in the process of working on it or read up on new literatures. And those spin-off ideas might also be where it's useful to think about, are there others I can collaborate with uh, on, on those? So think creatively about how can you create publications out of what you're already working on so that you can focus on writing your dissertation uh, while at the same time also working to, to get those publications or that one really good publication you need. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I was, so what the idea that comes across is it's very important to collaborate, to meet people, to talk with them, to exchange ideas. Um, but, and, and it's often mentioned that we should get, that, we, that networks are important, but how do you even get into those networks? Like, is it, is it a conference that will, that, that will be the key to the, to the network? Or what do you think? How can we get into networks? I have to jump at this. I was on a panel like this probably 10 years ago when I was still a graduate student. And um, the first person who went was just like, it was a senior person at UCLA who was completely dismissing the value of conferences and like, oh, you could go there, and, but you'd have to hang out with political scientists and God, you know, why would you want to do that? And I just thought that like, well, why the heck are you a political scientist if you don't like the people? I mean, it just, every, I, I strongly disagreed with everything the person who went before me was saying, and this was a se very senior person. And my experience as a graduate student was that I, I networked the hell out of conferences when I was a graduate student. I very, very intentionally made a list of who were the people that I wanted to meet in my discipline? Who were the people that I'd been citing that were doing the work that I was influenced by? And I went through the conference program and I started going to conferences very early on as a graduate student and figuring out who were the people that, that I wanted to meet and going and reading their papers and listening to what they were doing and paying attention to how they were doing it and introducing myself at the end of every panel. Um, and I just did that again and again and again and again. And one of the nice things about academia is that we're all very dorky. And so if you're <laughs> moderately able to talk to another person, um, this gives you a really comparative advantage. And you can have a nice few minutes of chit chat after the, the awkward initial couple minutes. Um, and you can invite them to lunch or to coffee because very often we don't have anything to do after the panel and you know we're really not sure what's going on and so if you invite someone to go get coffee very often even if they're fairly senior they will take you up on it um, and um, it networking isn't some magic-y thing it's it's just about being a person um, and wanting to get to know these other people that are um, just you know like you they're just older and awkward rather than younger and awkward and so take advantage of that and just be a little bit forward. Use the opportunity to, to, to talk with them, to ask them about their research. You know, if you can, read the paper ahead of time um, or take copious notes with it and just try to engage them as a real person. Also, have an elevator pitch version mm -hmm. of your work. If you do not, if you cannot tell me what your dissertation topic is in less than 20 words, yeah. then don't get on the elevator with me. Um, do not get on the elevator with me at CEU unless you can tell me your dissertation topic in less than 20 words. I had an, a fantastic experience at a conference as a result of one of these networking interchanges. I ended up talking with Jonathan Bender, who does, uh, who's a, a researcher at Stanford who does nothing that I do at all, and we're not at all intellectually related, but we've been conference buddies now for, God, like 15 years. And at a very early conference in my career, um, I, he said, oh, well, what do you do? And I went, blah, 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 and he said, no. I said, well, I do, blah, 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 and no. And we spent an hour, he spent an hour with me, which was an incredible investment in my career, just helping me to form this vague sense of sort of what I thought I kind of was thinking about maybe somewhat doing with kind of this thing, boom. Formed it, it helped me to form it into a 16 word sentence that then went on a, postcard on a little uh, note card in front of my laptop on um, front of my desktop computer and when I finished my dissertation and took it off there was a space a white space because that card had been in front of the damn la uh, computer screen for such a long time it had changed the color of it but that one sentence had reframed my entire research agenda 
and help me to crystallize exactly what the question I was asking was going to be in less than 20 words. Do that, have a mission statement for your academic career in general, but for your dissertation, you really, really need to have a elevator pitch, less than 20 word description of what your research is about that gets to the methods, that gets to the core questions, that references the literature, obviously. Spend a lot of time on that because that 20 words will pay a massive dividend to you because every time you run into somebody at conference, they will ask you what you do and you can give them that 20 words. And this is, I think, one of the keys to networking. combining both networking and how to write things up or how to summarize things. So uh, the, uh, a good way to get into networks is, of course, to go to conferences. Uh, and my experience is that uh, uh, many young people, or sometimes even older people, of course, fail because they, they are unable to come out with an abstract, with a proposal, with a half a page proposal uh, about their research or f that particular topic they, they want to sell in that uh, conference uh, uh, successfully. So that's why uh, there are very often so many rejections and I know young people tend to complain that they are unable to get into an ECPR conference, into a workshop or things like that. And the reason behind as far as I can judge, is often this problem, you know, that uh, you have to learn how to uh, formulate your thesis in that particular research paper very precisely in a concise manner and uh, in an interesting manner so that the person who reads it will say, should say, okay, this is what I want. And then, you know, a conference occasion or a workshop like that, you know, will give you the first uh, uh, opportunity or one of the first opportunities to, to get into the network that you really want to get into with, with that particular topic which is related to your research as well. Um, yeah.